Up from Slavery, the Autobiography of Booker T. Washington, Chapter 15, Part 2. Among those on the platform was Sergeant William H. Carney of New Bedford, Massachusetts, the brave colored officer who was the color bearer at Fort Wagner and held the American flag. In spite of the fact that a large part of his regiment was killed, he escaped and exclaimed after the battle was over, the old flag never touched the ground. This flag Sergeant Carney held in his hands as he sat on the platform, and when I turned to address the survivors of the colored regiment who were present and referred to Sergeant Carney, he rose as if by instinct and raised the flag. It has been my privilege to witness a good many satisfactory and rather sensational demonstrations in connection with some of my public addresses, but in dramatic effect I have never seen or experienced anything which equaled this. For a number of minutes, the audience seemed to entirely lose control of itself. In the general rejoicing throughout the country which followed the close of the Spanish-American War, peace celebrations were arranged in several of the large cities. I was asked by President William R. Harper of the University of Chicago, who was chairman of the Committee of Invitations for the Celebration to be held in the city of Chicago, to deliver one of the addresses at the celebration there. I accepted the invitation and delivered two addresses there during the Jubilee Week. The first of these, and the principal one, was given in the auditorium on the evening of Sunday, October 16th. This was the largest audience that I had ever addressed in any part of the country, and besides speaking in the main auditorium, I also addressed that same evening two overflow audiences in other parts of the city. It was said that there were 16,000 persons in the auditorium, and it seemed to me as if there were as many more on the outside trying to get in. It was impossible for anyone to get near the entrance without the aid of a policeman. President William McKinley attended this meeting, as did also the members of his cabinet, many foreign ministers, and a large number of Army and Navy officers, many of whom had distinguished themselves in the war which had just closed. The speakers besides myself on Sunday evening were Rabbi Emil G. Hirsch, Father of Thomas P. Hodnett, and Dr. John H. Barrows. The Chicago Times Herald, in describing the meeting, said of my address, He pictured the Negro choosing slavery rather than an extinction recalled Crispus Attucks shedding his blood at the beginning of the American Revolution that white Americans might be free while black Americans remained in slavery, rehearsed the conduct of the Negroes with Jackson at New Orleans, drew a vivid and pathetic picture of the southern slaves protecting and supporting the families of their masters while the latter were fighting to perpetuate black slavery, recounted the bravery of colored troops at Port Hudson and Forts Wagner and Pillow, and praised the heroism of the black regiments that stormed El Caney and Santiago to give freedom to the enslaved people of Cuba, forgetting, for the time being, the unjust discrimination that law and custom make against them in their own country. In all of these things, the speaker declared his race had chosen the better part. And then he made his eloquent appeal to the consciences of white Americans. When you have gotten the full story of the heroic conduct of the Negro in the Spanish-American War, have heard it from the lips of northern soldiers and southern soldiers, From ex-abolitionists and ex-masters, then decide within yourselves whether a race that is thus willing to die for its country should not be given the highest opportunity to live for its country. The part of the speech which seems to arouse the wildest, most sensational enthusiasm was that in which I thanked the president for his recognition of the Negro and his appointments during the Spanish-American War. The president was sitting in a box at the right of the stage. When I addressed him, I turned toward the box, and as I finished the sentence thanking him for his generosity, the whole audience rose and cheered again and again, waving handkerchiefs and hats and canes until the president arose in the box and bowed his acknowledgments. At that, the enthusiasm broke out again and the demonstration was almost indescribable. One portion of my address at Chicago seemed to have been misunderstood by the Southern press and some of the Southern papers took occasion to criticize me rather strongly. These criticisms continued for several weeks until I finally received a letter from the editor of the Age Herald published in Birmingham, Alabama, asking me if I would just say just what I meant by this part of the address. I replied to him in a letter which seemed to satisfy my critics. In this letter, I said that I made it a rule never to say before a northern audience anything that I would not say before an audience in the south. I said that I did not think it was necessary for me to go into extended explanations. If my 17 years of work in the heart of the south had not been explanation enough, I did not see how words could explain. I said that I made the same plea that I had made in my address at Atlanta for the blotting out of a race prejudice in commercial and civil relations. I said that what is termed social recognition was a question which I never discussed, and then I quoted from my Atlanta address what I had said there in regard to the subject. In meeting crowds of people at public gatherings, there is one type of individual that I dread. I mean the crank. I become so accustomed to these people now that I can pick them out at a distance when I see them elbowing their way up to me. The average crank has a long beard, poorly cared for, a lean, narrow face, and wears a black coat. 
The front of his vest and coat are slick with grease and his trousers bag at the knees. In Chicago, after I had spoken at a meeting, I met one of these fellows. They usually have some process for curing all the ills of the world at once. This Chicago specimen had a patent process by which he said Indian corn could be kept through a period of three or four years, and he felt sure that if the Negro race in the South would, as a whole, adopt his process, it would settle the whole race question. It mattered nothing that I tried to convince him that our present problem was to teach the Negroes how to produce enough corn to last them through one year. Another Chicago crank had a scheme by which he wanted me to join him in an effort to close up all the national banks in the country. If that was done, he felt sure it would put the Negro on his feet. The number of people who stand ready to consume one's time to no purpose is almost countless. At one time, I spoke before a large audience in Boston in the evening. The next morning, I was awakened by having a card brought to my room and with it a message that someone was anxious to see me. Thinking that it must be something very important, I dressed hastily and went down. When I reached the hotel office, I found a blank and innocent-looking individual waiting for me, who coolly remarked, I heard you talk in a meeting last night. I rather liked your talk, so I came in this morning to hear you talk some more. I am often asked how it is possible for me to superintend the work at Tuskegee and at the same time be so much away from the school. In partial answer to this, I would say that I think I have learned, in some degree at least, to disregard the old maxim which says, Do not get others to do that which you can do yourself. My motto, on the other hand, is do not do that which others can do as well. One of the most encouraging signs in connection with the Tuskegee School is found in the fact that the organization is so thorough that the daily work of the school is not dependent upon the presence of any one individual. The whole executive force, including instructors and clerks, now numbers 86. This force is so organized and subdivided that the machinery of the school goes on day by day like clockwork. Most of our teachers have been connected with the institutions for a number of years and are as much interested in it as I am. In my absence, Mr. Warren Logan, the treasurer, who has been at the school 17 years as the executive. He is efficiently supported by Mrs. Washington and by my faithful secretary. Mr. Emmett J. Scott, who handles the bulk of my correspondence and keeps me in daily touch with the life of the school and who also keeps me informed of whatever takes place in the South that concerns the race. I owe more to his tact, wisdom, and hard work than I can describe. The main executive work of the school, how, whether I'm at Tuskegee or not, centers in what we call the executive council. This council meets twice a week and is composed of the nine persons who are at the head of the nine departments of the school. For example, Mrs. B.K. Bruce, the lady principal, the widow of the late ex-Senator Bruce, is a member of the council and represents in it all that pertains to the life of the girls at the school. In addition to the executive council, there's a financial committee of six that meets every week and decides upon the expenditures for the week. Once a month, and sometimes oftener, there is a general meeting of all the instructors. Aside from these, there are innumerable smaller meetings, such as that of the instructors in the Phelps Hall Bible Training School, or of the instructors in the Agricultural Department. In order that I may keep in constant touch with the life of the institution, I have a system of reports so arranged that a record of the school's work reaches me every day of the year, no matter in what part of the country I am. I know by these reports even what students are excused from school, and why they are excused, whether for reasons of ill health or otherwise. Through the medium of these reports, I know each day what the income of the school in money is. I know how many gallons of milk and how many pounds of butter come from the dairy, and what the bill of fare for the teachers and students is, whether a certain kind of meat was boiled or baked, and whether certain vegetables served in the dining room were bought from a store or procured from our own farm. Human nature I find to be very much the same the world over, and it is sometimes not hard to yield to the temptation to go a barrel of rice that has to go to a barrel of rice that has come from the store with the grain all prepared to go in the pot rather than to take the time and trouble to go to the field and dig and wash one's own sweet potatoes which might be prepared in a manner to take the place of the rice. I am often asked how, in the midst of so much work, a large part of which is for the public, I can find for any rest or recreation and what kind of recreation or sports I am fond of. This is a rather difficult question to answer. I have a very strong feeling that every individual owes it to himself and to the cause which she is serving, to keep a vigorous, healthy body with the nerves steady and strong, prepared for great efforts and prepared for disappointments and trying positions. As far as I can, I make it a rule to plan for each day's work, not merely to go through with the same routine of daily duties, but to get rid of the routine work as early in the day as possible, and then to enter upon some new or advanced work. I make it a clear a rule to clear my desk every day before leaving my office of all correspondence and memoranda, so that on the morrow I can begin a new day of work. I make it a rule never to let my work drive me, but so to so master it and keep it in such complete control 
and to keep so far ahead of it that I will be the master instead of the servant. There is a physical and mental and spiritual enjoyment that comes from a consciousness of being the absolute master of one's work in all its details that is very satisfactory and inspiring. My experience teaches me that if one learns to follow this plan, he gets a freshness of body and vigor of mind out of work that goes a long way toward keeping him strong and healthy. I believe that when one can grow to the point where he loves his work, this gives him a kind of strength that is most valuable. When I begin my work in the morning, I expect to have a successful and pleasant day of it, but at the same time, I prepare myself for unpleasantness and unexpected hard places. I prepared myself to hear one of our school buildings is on fire or has burned or that some disagreeable accident has occurred or that someone has abused me in a public address or printed article for something that I have done or omitted to do or for something that he had heard that I said, probably something that I had never thought of saying. In 19 years of continuous work, I have taken but one vacation. That was two years ago when some of my friends put the money into my hands and forced Mrs. Washington and myself to spend three months in Europe. I have said that I believe it is the duty of everyone to keep his body in good condition. I try to look after the little ills with the idea that if I take care of the little ills, the big ones will not come. When I find myself unable to sleep well, I know that something is wrong. If I find any part of my system the least weak and not performing its duty, I consult a good physician. The ability to sleep well at any time and in any place I find of great advantage. I have so trained myself that I can lie down for a nap of 15 or 20 minutes and get up refreshed in body and mind. I have said that I make it a rule to finish up each day's work before leaving it. There is perhaps one exception to this. When I have an unusually difficult question to decide, one that appeals strongly to the emotions, I find it a safe rule to sleep over over it for a night or to wait until I have had opportunity to talk it over with my wife and friends. As to my reading, the most time I get for solid reading is when I'm on the cars. Newspapers are to me a constant source of delight and recreation. The only trouble is that I read too many of them. Fiction I care little for. Frequently, I have to almost force myself to read a novel that is on everyone's lips. The kind of reading that I have the greatest fondness for is biography. I like to be sure that I am reading about a real man or a real thing. I think I do not go too far when I say that I've read nearly every book and magazine article that has ever been written about Abraham Lincoln. In literature, he is my patron saint. Out of the 12 months in a year, I suppose that on average I spend six months away from Tuskegee. While my being absent from the school so much unquestionably has its disadvantages, Yet there are at the same time some compensations. The change of work brings a certain kind of rest. I enjoy a ride of a long distance on the cars when I am permitted to ride where I can be comfortable. I get rest on the cars except when the inevitable individual who seems to be on every train approaches me with the now familiar phrase, Isn't this Booker T. Washington? I want to introduce myself to you. Absent from the school enables me to lose sight of the unimportant details of the work and study it in a broader and more comprehensive manner than I could do on the grounds. This absence also brings me into contact with the best work being done in educational lines and into contact with the best educators in the land. But after all this is said, the time when I get the most solid rest and recreation is when I can be at Tuskegee and after our evening meal is over can sit down as is our custom with my wife and Portia and Baker and Davidson, my three children, and read a story or each take turns in telling a story. To me, there is nothing on earth equal to that, although what is nearly equal to it is to go with them for an hour or more, as we like to do on Sunday afternoons, into the woods where we can live for a while near the heart of nature, where no one can disturb or vex us, surrounded by pure air, the trees, the shrubbery, the flowers, and the sweet fragrance that that springs from a hundred plants, enjoying the chirp of the crickets and the songs of the birds. This is solid rest. My garden also, what little time I can be at Tuskegee, is another source of rest and enjoyment. Somehow I like, as often as possible, to touch nature, Not something that is artificial or an imitation, but the real thing. When I can leave my office in time so that I can spend 30 or 40 minutes in spading the ground and planting seeds and digging about the plants, I feel that I'm coming into contact with something that is giving me strength for the many duties and hard places that await me out in the big world. I pity the man or woman who has never learned to enjoy nature and to get strength and inspiration out of it. Aside from the large number of fowls and animals kept by the school, I keep individually a number of pigs and fowls of the best grades, and in raising these, I take a great deal of pleasure. I think the pig is my favorite animal. Few things are more satisfactory to me than a high-grade Berkshire or Poland China pig. Games I care little for. I have never seen a game of football. In cards, I do not know one card from another. A game of old-fashioned marbles with my two boys once in a while is all that I care for in this direction. I suppose I would care for games now if I had had time in my youth to give to them, but that was not possible. Hey, it's a privilege to read 
Up From Slavery, an autobiography of Booker T. Washington with you. Would love it if you could subscribe to the channel and hear our other videos in this playlist for the rest of the autobiography. It would be awesome if you could check out these playlists as well. They might be interesting or funny or something uh, at least amuse you for a little bit. Thanks for watching. Until next time.